What do we want? Free Rasia. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Free Rasia. What do we want it? Now. whose mission, funded by the Israeli government, whose mission is when you can't actually have imprisoned these people and criminalize them, then you want to uh, deplete their resources through lawfare. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 23 cable stations from Vermont to New York City, on the internet at thestruggle.org our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. We begin with a Hartford demonstration against attempts by the Obama administration to jail and deport a torture victim, Rosmia Oda. Then a large portion of the talk given at the left forum by famed Palestinian activist and attorney, Lamise Deek. She talks about Islamophobia and police state plots, there's no better way to talk about them, against Al Auda New York. We end with a new humorous segment from Apartheid Adventures called Apartheid New and Improved. We begin in Hartford, Connecticut, with people upset about the arrest of Rosmia Oda, a victim of terrible torture by. Israeli authorities in the late 1960s. She came to the U.S. some 20 years ago, became a citizen 10 years ago. She was arrested several months ago after U.S. authorities said that in reviewing her immigration papers, they found that she was lying about her time in an Israeli prison. Now! What do we want? Free Brazil! What do we want? It? Now! What do we want? Free Rasia! What do we want it? Now! What do we want? Free Rasia! What do we want it? Now! What do we want? Free Rasia! What do we want it? Now! What do we want? Drop the charges! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Drop the charges! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Drop the charges! When do we want it? Now! You're holding a sign about hands off Palestinian solidarity activists. Could you explain what the demonstration is about? Yes, um, there's a, uh, it seems to be a trend of uh, U.S. government harassment, FBI harassment uh, against uh, activists, especially in the uh, Palestinian community. Um, recently, uh, there was a, a woman, a um, Palestinian woman um, in Detroit named uh, Razmi O'Day who was uh, uh, being uh, charged with lying on immigration forms over uh, 20 years ago, allegedly lying on them. And uh, this is a woman who had been tortured by the uh, Israeli Defense Forces, uh, you know, 45 years ago, uh, is a victim of torture. And, um, and these are kind of trumped up charges uh, based on her activity in the uh, Palestinian Solidarity Movement. Um, and uh, this has been going on for a while now. Uh, in Chicago, you know, the FBI has been harassing the Palestinian community, interviewing, you know, uh, or um, interrogating uh, Palestinians at their places of work. And, um, you know, we're out here to say that the, the charges against Razmiya are bogus and they should be dropped. And that uh, the harassment of the Palestinian community and the activist community also needs to end uh, right now. So, Leila, why did you come to this rally today? Um, I'd like to consider myself an activist when it comes to injustices happening in Palestine. Um, this past semester, for the first time, I started a Students for Justice in Palestine group at my campus in U of UConn in West Hartford. We never had one before, so we just got that started. And I heard about the rally today, and uh, Rizmia is from Palestine, and the trial is about her. and. So we, uh, me and my brother here decided that it would be in our best interest to come to the rally and maybe notify passerbyers of, you know, what's happening with the trial and everything like that. You're not Palestinian yourself, so how did you get interested in this cause? Um, I'm not Palestinian, but, um, you know, I heard about, I hear about the injustices. I have a lot of Palestinian friends, um, I'm not necessarily Muslim. I have Christian friends that live in Palestine currently as well, so it's not about religion. I just know that there are injustices happening there um, for, you know, an array of reasons. And I just, um, I got interested because, you know, it's not, nobody likes to hear that, you know, fellow human beings are being, you know, 
antagonized, you know, their houses are being bulldozed and nobody wants to hear that, whether it be from Palestine, Syria, any country in the world. So that's how um, I became interested in human rights with Palestine specifically. And also um, a lot of the injustices aren't brought to light as well, and I believe that they should be. Mike, why did you come up today for this demonstration? Uh, all of us uh, need uh, to be uh, together uh, to end the uh, oppression, um, profiling of uh, Palestinians in America, and we simultaneously need to uh, speak out uh, against uh, the oppression of uh, the Palestinians in the occupied territories. Uh, I was there. Uh, for uh, 10 days at the end of uh, March. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I saw was just uh, shattering uh, to me. Uh, I grew up in uh, the Jewish faith. I continue to value uh, the Jewish uh, faith and the traditions, but uh, what they've been doing to uh, the Palestinians, uh, to me, is a total uh, contradiction of uh, the Jewish faith. It's time for uh, Jewish people uh, to stop the oppression and uh, reclaim their identity. Yeah. Now, the federal government says she broke the law, she uh, incorrectly filled out her immigration application. What do you think about that? Uh, it's, it's a totally, uh, you know, uh, frivolous, you know, and uh, bonus, bogus uh, allegation. Uh, she was, she was, she was tortured. Um, it, it's horribly difficult, you know, for someone, uh, you know, who left uh, Palestine, you know, under uh, those uh, conditions, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to write down some of those things uh, that happened. Uh, enough is enough. I think it's more important than ever for people of uh, faith orientations and and our, the citizens of our country to rise up and be voices uh, for. Uh, those who are suffering from injustice wherever they might be and and in this particular instance uh, where we see somebody who um, is part of the wider occupation issues that uh, that of uh, people in Israel and Palestine are, are suffering from I think it's more very important for us to, the average citizen to come out and, and speak, be a voice for justice now the church that you're associated with in old Lyme, the congregational church has done a lot in terms of the Palestinian and Israeli issues and I understand a person who spoke num numerous times at the church has had a, one of his whole orchards destroyed. Could you talk about that? Yeah, our church uh, has a very close friendship with Daoud Nasser who is uh, part of the, he's the founder of an organization called Tent of Nations, and they have a, a farm that that uh, has been deeded to them from the Ottoman days, and they're surrounded by settlements, and uh, they're unable to do to build anything above ground, so they do a lot of their operation underground. Uh, we've had the honor of every year that we go over there planting more olive trees in their, in their orchard, uh, so that there's now what's called a tree of life orchard. And we were deeply saddened to learn that uh, just recently the IDF came in and bulldozed 1,500 of those olive trees, olive trees and almond trees. And uh, I think uh, um, for every tragedy like this, there's a silver lining and that I think that it's uh, helped to wake up uh, the international community to the fact that this is done. And I was suspect... Is there a lot of attention to it in, uh, internationally? Yeah, the, uh, the interfaith community within this country and around the world has, has, has risen to the challenge and I think that uh, there will be a collective effort to replant all those trees and this helps to highlight the kind of indignity and inhumanity that takes place, not just at Tent of Nations, but every day affecting um, our Palestinian friends. Now we hear from Lamy Steek, who spoke at the end of May at the Left Forum. And when we look at um, the Islamophobia network and the Islamophobia industry, uh, aside from what they've discussed and Max will discuss more after me, but of the 12 primary Islamophobia movement runners, you know, the, the real owners, the, the thrust of the movement, of those 12, seven of them are Zionist groups, okay? Four of them are dispatched directly from Israel. I mean, that's tremendous, right? 
Um, there's 37 groups, half of them are Zionist. Of the top 12, seven are, are, are Zionist, four of which are dispatched from Israel. So there's a symbiotic and cyclical relationship between um, civil and, you know, I don't know if we can even call a lot of these groups NGOs, and maybe we need to consider um, exposing and deconstructing the role of the Israeli government in building and proliferating them, because at which point they're not NGOs if they are being directed um, by the Israeli government or its agents. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I don't know which cases to highlight, really, um, uh, the NYPD cases, um, but, but there, there's a lot. I mean, everything from, you know, post 9-11, we didn't, uh, after 9-11, before 9-11, let me, let me say this, before 9-11, when we were organizing rallies in New York um, in support of the Palestinian Intifada, our rallies were 100, 200,000 people strong, right? So strong, the streets would actually, you would feel Times Square shaking underneath your feet, right? 9-11, that was all gone. The, palace, the best of the, the Palestinian organizers and, and community of organizers were gutted, uh, either by deportations, intimidation, or outright arrest and criminalization. Um, and it wasn't until the, the first Gaza war, December 27, 2008, that we saw the resurgence of Palestinians. We saw a lot of Palestinian solidarity work happening, and it was very visible. Um, and there was a lot of secular Palestinian organizing, but it wasn't until 2008 that you saw Palestinians, Arabs, taking back to the streets. Um, and immediately, as soon as tens of thousands of Arabs and Palestinians were back in the street, the NYPD went straight into action in coordination with the district attorney's office. We had um, our organizations were infiltrated, Al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return, one of the oldest national organizations. Um, our core group was infiltrated by two NYPD officers. Um, the same day, even before that, I'll get to that in a second, that happened two months later, um, at the very last uh, anti-war rally in support of Palestine, the NYPD, and we could tell, I, I've been doing rallies for 14 years at this point, and I always did security, we never had an issue. NYPD was posted at every uh, you know, train uh, train stop and every uh, train station and everywhere they could. There was another pro-Israeli rally happening with a hundred people, and Governor Patterson was in attendance at the time. Rally went with tens of thousands of people without incidents. As we were leaving, all of a sudden, um, there's a stampede. Uh, cops are are walking into our rally as we're exiting. Uh, on horseback, and they're macing men, women, and children, and we had the first case, the Palestine Nine. It was not a coincidence. We've never had a, a, an incident, and if we did, they were minor, they were always well resolved. All of a sudden, there's this massive, you know, calculated attack, and an intent to, to criminalize and, and stop this from happening again. Within a couple of months, Al Auda gets infiltrated by two NYPD officers. These NYPD officers use the credibility of Al Auda um, in the, the Muslim and Arab Muslim uh, circles to try to get access and to criminalize other parties. Now, millions of dollars are being spent. This is a massive operation. Two years later, nothing happens. I mean, there's, you know, we don't do anything that's illegal. Uh, we are very clear on our positions, and you know, I say them, but I don't believe in the state of Israel, and I don't care to. Um, and so, they can't arrest either anybody from Al Auda or its network or any of the Arab and Muslim uh, groups that work on Palestinian issues. So they find a young man named Ahmed Farhani, who, from the age, and this is the NYPD who from the age of 17, the NYPD themselves, and Professor Dr. Teach is here, and he was uh, a forensic analyst on that case as well. The NYPD themselves were picking him up from his home and bringing him into a mental health institution, Elmhurst and Bellevue and the like. So the only person that they can find to justify the money that they are spending on criminalizing or deterring the free speech activities and organizing around Palestine is this very mental ill young man who can they can even try to convince because because they hadn't convinced him and we're sure of that into buying guns um, for something that you know the the undercover NYPD cop who we thought was a member of Alauda would would try to convince him to do but talking more about the symbiosis in this right so of course Alauda was a target of, of this investigation but you know, we have nothing to hide and we engage in no criminal activity. During the course of, of our infiltration of Al Auda, I came to represent this officer, 
right? So they had staged, uh, yes, the NYPD had staged between themselves a fake uh, altercation between each other. So it was pretended that this guy, we'll call him 242, that 242 had gotten into a fight with, an, with a cop uh, during the Park Place, 9-11 Park Place rallies, right? And I came to be his lawyer, right? And this was staged intentionally with, with the purpose of having me become his attorney for two reasons, either to find me engaging in, you know, uh, unethical or criminal practices, or to, to find a way to preclude me from representing whoever 242 would come to incriminate later. All right. So, and this is a lot, a little circular, and, and I'm going to stop on this. I mean, okay, so we get through the case, Professor Teach, Elizabeth Fink, myself, Fahad Ahmed, a few lawyers, we do a fairly good job. We get a fairly good deal. I think it's a fantastic deal. The case is resolved. At the same time, Al Auda is now being sued by, uh, it, <laughs> during one of the rallies that happened at the same time, and, and this tells you about, uh, really, the, uh, I hope, I don't know how, sir, uh, if this is making sense. So we're being infiltrated, we're dealing with this case, I'm representing this NYPD cop, we're still having the rallies that are coming under attack. At the one year commemoration rally, after we've been infiltrated, uh, the, the rally has entered, a bunch of uh, m girls from a Muslim youth group had come from the Bronx, the rally's over, they're hanging out at a pizzeria, and uh, a, a man named John Kenny starts yelling and cursing at these girls, you terrorists, go back to your country. Another man who had, white man from Boston, had previously attended the rally, heard this, he goes back, he had a bullhorn in his hand, he starts chanting on this bullhorn, free, free Palestine. John Kenny, the man who's attacking the girls, goes up to Michael Williams and tries to hit it. He's, he's kind of, I, I think he's inebriated at the time. You know, takes the first blow, John, uh, Michael Williams, you know, falls back, he's got the bullhorn in his hand, and he backhands him with the bullhorn as he's coming up with the second bull. They both get arrested, immediately all the charges are dropped against the man who was attacking the girls and the man who attacked Michael Williams, immediately. Uh, first appearance, post arraignment in court, the only thing that the prosecutor could tell the judge to attempt to inflame uh, the courtroom and to, to persuade the judge to remand, bring back into prison Michael Williams, is how Michael Williams kept repeating free, free Palestine as he was chanting on the horn. That this chant, free Palestine, justifies getting beat up by a man who just attacked a bunch of girls. Right. So this is happening a year later, we have the case, and I can go, you know, how the, the district attorney's office turned the witnesses, the girls who were under attack, into um, it, into not, not the victims, but the aggressors by virtue of being Muslim and being affiliated with a, with a Muslim youth group. I mean, I, I showed the transcripts. All I did for the entirety of the trial was objection, objection, object. I mean, I literally just, I could have done that for, you know, six, seven hours straight and, and you know, objection, that's all it took. Um, you know, I, I showed the transcript to uh, an attorney who'd been practicing in the, in the appellate uh, division for 40, 50 years, and he'd never seen anything like this. But to the, there's a very intimate uh, relationship. So now, there isn't much organizing happening. We've won this case, we've won that case. John Kenny, the drunk man who hits Michael Williams and attacks the girls, is now suing Al Auda because the girls and Michael Williams happened to be at a rally a few minutes beforehand. The rally had ended. And therefore, they're, they're now suing Al Auda. Um, so, it's no coincidence then that, you know, when you look at the Clarion Fund, which is the organization that funded the videos which trained the NYPD, the third jihad video that tells you all the Muslims are trying to take over America and they're all evil and of course therefore Palestinians who also happen to be largely Muslim are evil and they can't be trusted and you got to monitor and surveil them. The Clarion Fund is also affiliated with Aish Hatora or is an offshoot of Aish Hatora, whose, uh, whose mission, funded by the Israeli government, whose mission is when you can't actually have imprisoned these people and criminalize them, then you want to uh, deplete their resources through lawfare, which is what Al Auda had experienced. First we were infiltrated, the, the youth membership found out that this guy who was their friend was a cop, they're scared off, we're still functioning as an organization, so now you, so, you sue us in civil court until you really, and this has happened with countless organizations throughout the history of Palestinian organizing. And, and then my last example, which is a really, I think, very sick example of the relationship, the symbiotic relationship between 
the, the prosecutors in New York and the, the, the Zionist groups uh, in the U.S. and the Israeli government. May 15th commemorates the anniversary of a Nakba. That's when Palestinians commemorate the anniversary of a Nakba, the expulsion of the two-thirds of the Palestinian population. This year, you know, uh, because of the infiltrations that we experienced and the, the Palestinian Muslim groups have experienced and the kind of position that the Palestinian Solidarity Movement is in and, and you know, we're trying to get our footing last year, there wasn't, there wasn't much, uh, much happening on the ground, right? But just in case, the NYPD and the prosecutor's office was very ready. May 15th, 2013, the NYPD and Bloomberg announced the arrest of 15 Palestinian men, Palestinian elders, right? And they announced that all of these elders uh, were related to, all these Palestinian men have ties to Hamas and Hezbollah and that they were, you know, transporting cigarettes for God's sake. Transporting cigarettes um, and selling them and making an increased profit because all of that money was going into the anti-Israeli resistance, right? So we noticed that they're missing on that day. I, I'm sure it's not a coincidence. We're out looking for them. We th I, I'm thinking, you know, it's May 15th. They're all Palestinian. This has got to be like a terrorism case. Get to court, you know, and they're, they're all. It, it was a great photo opportunity. They're all in shackles. I mean, you know, there were legal aid attorneys in that courtroom that were practicing, you know, in that courtroom for 30 years who've never seen this before. There was nobody in the courtroom but them, right? They're all in shackles, and they're all shackled to each other, right? for tax evasion, supposedly, right? With a 300 plus page indictment, not a single word on any of that money go, going anywhere. And I am certain, knowing <coughs> the surveillance history of these people and having seen it and knowing uh, the defendants, many of whom I knew personally for a very long time and who were active in Palestinian work here and back home, that this entire operation um, and that arrest happened because of three people who were under surveillance for a long time, who were very effective in their organizing, whom Israel didn't like for various reasons. They have been targets of the Israeli government for a long time. That this happened because of them. And, and for the past 20, 30 years, they haven't been able to arrest them on anything. Finally, they get financially broke. They, they buy, you know, untaxed, supposedly buy untaxed cigarettes from Virginia and they sell them for an extra $2, $2 in New York. That's what happened. Right? Um, but this really speaks to, okay, just make sure it's on May 15th, make sure it's these Palestinians. Now, in the recordings, the surveillance for this tax evasion uh, operation, there are conversations and actors that are Russian and Latino and Chinese and Asian and otherwise. Not a single one of them was arrested, and I, we're talking about dozens and dozens of people. Not a single one of them was arrested, not a single one of them was indicted, not a single one of them was included, and it wasn't even the general Arabs who happened to be North African. It was only the Palestinians to be arrested on May 15th, 1948, on, on May 15th, 2013. And I'm gonna leave it on that. But I think, I hope that really hammers in um, our struggle and the need to demand, as I think George said, and Al Muyali said at our old panel, to demand the, the exposure um, and transparency and the end of the Israelization of our governmental institutions in New York specifically, where we face them on a whole other level. Sorry if I went too long. At the Left Forum, we heard about the death of Yuri Kochiyama, a friend of Malcolm X. She's best known for her successful campaign to get reparation payments for Japanese Americans unjustly imprisoned without charge during World War II. We know her in Connecticut two years ago. She refused an award from UNESCO that was going to be presented at UConn. She and others refused the award because it was also being given to apartheid Israeli president, Shimon Peres. Now another satirical pot shot from the folks at Apartheid Adventures. 
What is more fun than a stack of turtles? What has fewer calories than a basket of cat videos? Less cholesterol than a sleeping puppy? More colorful than a sunny day in Iceland? What is invisible, weightless, tasteless, thoughtless, goes where you go, healthy, non-fattening, free of charge, and if you're of the correct ethnic religious category, you're born with it. Only one thing is all that, you guessed it, apartheid, where your ethnic privilege sets you apart from those who don't have it. That's why Israel is the place for you, if you're of the correct ethnic religious category. Because in Israel, we have reimagined apartheid. Not the old outdated black and white South African apartheid with guns and tanks and checkpoints and segregation and Bantu stands. Well, we have all those too. But Israel's apartheid is in living color and we've added really high walls and unlimited U.S. support. Well, actually, they had that too for a while. So what we've actually done here is reimagined apartheid back the way it was. Classic apartheid still working for you if you're of the correct ethnic religious category where you get a chance to be safely separate. You wouldn't put a dog and a monkey or a cat and a lizard together, would you? Okay, how about a chimp and a pigeon? Okay, shut up. They don't have nation states to maintain, but you do. And don't you want one with an entire system of laws, prisons, armies, checkpoints, walls, even water resources working in your favor? Well, that's Israel, if you're of the correct ethnic religious category. Israeli apartheid classic. Yesterday's apartheid for tomorrow. Today. It worked for South Africa, it'll work for you. If you're of the correct ethnic religious category, you're gonna like the way we do apartheid. Go to our website, thestruggle.org, to learn about appearances of Jeff Halper in Connecticut. He'll be speaking four times. He's a coordinating director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. In this video, he speaks to Philip Weiss about the theft of Palestinian olive trees by Israeli settlers. So here's another ancient tree. In other words, this is part of the humiliation that, of the... Of, of that's an ancient olive tree. Now we're on tape. Yeah. Can you describe what I'm looking this at? This is probably a four or five hundred year olive tree. So it's part of the whole it, humiliation of the Palestinians. And it was transplanted here? You, you, yeah, there, as the wall is being built, or settlements are expanded, or highways are being built, these olive trees that have been in families, imagine, yeah. for 500 years, and giving you sustenance yeah. all those years, are uprooted. Yes. Finally, on our website, the new campaign, USS Liberty Cover-Up, including a new interview I did with one of the survivors of that infamous Israeli attack on the U.S. ship. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller and this is The Struggle.